My name is Officer Patrick Dolly, the Reading PD. Um, I've been an officer with Reading for approximately six years. I'm in law enforcement just shy of a decade. Um, I'm currently the armorer. Um, that means I'm in charge of firearms licensing, uh, the issued weapons of the Reading Police Department, knowing how to um, manipulate them, solve problems, etc. Um, equipment, fleet maintenance, and then firearms licensing. Obviously, um, I am training Officer Scott Craven, who can introduce himself at one moment, okay. and then also Erica Ballard, our new firing, firearms licensing administrative clerk. Uh, I'm Scott Craven. I grew up in town. Uh, I've been on the PD for two years. Prior to that, I worked for the Federal Reserve Police, so about five years or so of law enforcement experience. Um, like uh, Officer Dolly said, I'm taking over for him as the armorer. Um, so he's been in this position for about two years, at least in all of that, about two weeks. So doing the best I can, learn a lot from him. Um, but come January, I'll be taking over the position full time. Um, and I'll be working with Erica, who was also really hired. So I just want to introduce yourself real quick. I'm Erica Ballard. <laughs> I just started three weeks ago, so I'm just learning the position as well. I know a little bit of knowledge from my old job with firearms, so I'm learning from the best here. <laughs> so we do not claim to be experts. I'm sure some of you know guns far better than us. All right, but what we're going to talk about are um, concerns that that are you know, trends that within uh, law enforcement and what we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, national trends, and um, we're going to talk a little bit through the uh, the handout. We're going to talk a little bit about dementia and Alzheimer's. I am absolutely no expert in that matter whatsoever. Um, nor do I claim to be an expert in weaponry. However, through our training experience and um, you know, constant education that we do, um, hopefully we can have some answers. And if we don't, I'll be sure to find an answer for you and we'll touch on it, okay? So to get started, let's see if I can scroll through doing this. Wonderful, all right. So the town of Reading. Um, everybody here a resident of the town of Reading, I'm assuming. Uh, these statistics were the best I could find. Obviously, we're gonna have a new census in a couple of years, so these will probably be uh, vastly out of date at that point, but from the, the current rough numbers, approximately 25,000 individuals in the town of Reading. 14% of those uh, of that population makes up people who are of the age of 65 and older. So, firearms licenses for the last three years. Perhaps no one cares about this, but it just shows that the approximate state average per capita, um, Reading does far more, far above the average of LTCs. Um, our surrounding cities and towns do just over about 100 per year. Uh, we are far exceeding that. As you can see, last year, obviously there are a variety of reasons as to why people decide to get firearms licenses, and there was a vast increase. So we are still on pace. Um, Prior to that, we did about 125 per year, which is still above the state average. Um, and now we're just seeing a booming increase. In regards to the number of registered owners and the number of registered weapons in the town of Reading, that's a really difficult number to get an exact figure on. Just like driver's licenses, people move all the time, fail to update their, their addresses and whatnot. So we really don't know. So the purpose of this is to figure out Historically, the town of Reading, uh, there are a lot of what we classify as old guns in Reading that have been passed down from generation to generation. And we're gonna talk about what our concerns are with those and how we can solve that issue um, by you guys, the citizens, um, doing your part and us educating you on that part. All right. Um, I'll be your first question. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Is the number of licenses total or issued during the year? Issued during the year. Okay. These are these are renewals and new applicants. All right. So that could be that could be a 21 year old individual that just turned 21. Or it, could, it could technically be a 14 year old or 15 year old individual getting a fire identification card, or it could be a 83 year old individual who's had a firearms license for a couple decades and just wanted to renew, your, renew theirs because they were due for a renewal. So it's any and all in between. Thank you. Any police concerns? 
Okay. Um, so, <laughs> your turn. so uh, some of the concerns, so like I said, I've been doing this two weeks, so these were things that I didn't even know about until I started working um, with Officer Dolly. So some of the major concerns here, um, weapon and ammo left behind. Um, someone passes away, um, son, daughter, whoever, you know, goes to clean out the house. Um, they find weapons and ammo that either they weren't aware of or they knew about, it was never registered, it's, you know, an old gun. Um, improper registration inheritance, sort of going off of that. Someone passes away, they leave their firearms to one of their children. Um, so one of our concerns is people get the gun through inheritance and then they're not totally sure what to do with it. How do they register it? How long do they have to register it? Um, do they need to get their FID? Do they need to get their LTC to own the firearm? Um, improper storage. Uh, years back, um, proper storage of a firearm, um, you know, might be left above the mantle, left in a shoebox on the high shelf. Um, could be just put, you know, a panel on the wall that no one knows about because it was home protection. Um, laws have changed on that. Uh, proper storage is now a big issue. Um, we're going to go over everything that requires proper storage a little bit. And responsible ownership. Um, unfortunately, as people age, one of the main concerns is um, dementia. Um, people's you know, cognitive abilities can start to decline. Um, so if you have someone who in their 50s and 60s owned five or six weapons, they're now approaching 90 or so and their brain is starting to slip. Um, you know, the, the concerns of them still having a weapon, potentially an unregistered weapon that they bought 50 years ago that no one knows about. Um, so those are the key concerns we're going to cover here. All these concerns have come about in things that, through this position, that in my predecessors and now Officer Craven, we deal with on a fairly regular basis. We have great community outreach, um, which as a police department we take pride in, and we have a lot of citizens that come to us for questions to say, I don't know what to do. Um, I have this weapon, or this could potentially be an issue, what do we do? So in dealing with these and constantly going to houses um, and dealing with um, perhaps the most common example is a widow who um, stumbles across a gun in a sock drawer. Because that used to be a proper means of storage. That used to be an, an, an idea of a proper means of storage. Whether that's legal or not um, is why we're here to discuss that and educate individuals. But that, for whatever reason, or um, an owner who owned guns, then had children, and decided when safes were not readily purchasable as they are now, you can go to Home Depot and buy a gun safe now, where before they might have not been so readily available, and they would find a gap between two studs in the wall, cut open the drywall in the back of the closet, put the rifles in there, and then patch it over, and say, well, I know that they're there, no one else knows that they're there, so that's good to go. Well, if that's not written down and no one else knows about it, and that individual passes, and now, Reading being such a hotbed in the real estate market, well, that might be a, an estate sale or, you know, for, for whatever reason, that house goes on the market and then it's sold in, in a matter of days or doesn't even make it to market. No one else is going to know that those guns are in the wall. And then a renovation happens and, well, we found a couple of guns in the wall. So this is what we're trying to avoid. Because that might happen and we might never find out about it. And that gun might wind up in the wrong hand. And most concerning is guns that are improperly handled or wind up in the wrong hands can get turned against most commonly us as police officers, which we don't want to see for our, our brethren and fellow brothers and sister police officers. Um, but you know, God forbid we live in a fantastic town in the, the town of Reading and we don't have gun violence, but it could happen elsewhere. You know? Nothing's out of the realm of possibility. So, um, in, in, in regards to storage, storage, there are two key components that we talk about. We just talked about a, a bunch of examples. Scott mentioned the high mantle. I'm short, but the high mantle, all right? The tallest part of the house where the grandkids can't reach. That was the, that was the rule of thumb. The grandkids can't reach it, we're good to go, all right? Um, well, there's two means now in the law. A locked container and a mechanical device rendering that weapon inoperable. All right, those are the two 
main points of seeing whether your weapon is properly stored. So we'll go over the first one. I have some images here, and I picked these images very carefully because I agree and disagree with a few of them for particular reasons. So the locked container. What is a locked container? Most commonly, that's a gun safe. A steel, lockable, reinforceable, so heavy that one individual can't just pick it up and walk out with it, or it's secured to the floor by extra means. It is designed to hold guns. You have your, your, your gun locker closet on the far right. Holds long guns, it can hold pistols, it has a shelf. What I disagree with on that particular picture, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, is that there's ammunition and guns in the same locker. We'll go over that as a national best practice on what I would strongly encourage everybody to take into consideration. But I really like those nice tall lockers. I, went, I just did a simple search. So if I wanted to purchase one today, for $119 was the, the cheapest one I found, readily available within a 25 mile driving distance uh, radius, um, $119 at Walmart. You can buy something of that kind. Not that they come in all shapes, sizes, heights, um, concealability, extra, you know, little, uh, things in them, but $119, that's relatively inexpensive in the grand scheme of, you can't really, I can only think of very few guns that you can even buy for $119. So, this is the most important thing when it comes to gun safe. Next is the single size gun safe. That is the middle item. So, a lot of people only own handguns. They don't own long rifles or vice versa. I don't need this giant safe for my one small pistol or revolver that I own. That's great. The manufacturers thought about that and they created single size gun safes. Again, this is just one example. I'm not endorsing one brand over the next. This particular item, again, $100, approximately $100. The thing I disagree about this picture is you see, number one, those weapon, the pistol that's in there, doesn't have a mechanical device on it. Number two, there's jewelry in there. Um, so the two big things with that, again, we'll go into it in more detail. A small single, size, single gun safe is made for a single gun, and that's it. If it has two shelves, maybe two guns, but you don't want somebody to say, hey, I know that you uh, keep a little bit of cash around. Do you mind if I go borrow 20 bucks? Sure, it's in the safe. Why don't you go up in there and get it for me? They reach into the safe thinking they're reaching in for cash or an item or whatnot, and nope, that is a gun. Maybe that person shouldn't be handling that gun. Maybe they weren't expecting it. That's how an accident potentially could happen. So that's why best practice, just the gun in a gun safe, and that you have a dedicated valuables box for valuables. The exception to that, and same with the tall gun locker there, I wish that all of those rifles had some sort of uh, mechanism on them, rendering them inoperable, um, and most importantly, unloaded. Um, but with that particular item, they do make safes that are so big, that are the size of rooms, or that are just vastly so large that upon opening them, you could clearly see that they have different oriented areas that are for valuables. I would say that would be the one exception, that a safe is so large that someone having to use two hands to pry open that door to see it would clearly be able to see that valuables go in one particular spot. It wouldn't be blindly reaching in such as that as a single gun safe, whereas you are, it is for quick access or for immediate access, that that weapon is um, by in itself for a smaller safe. And then lastly, fireproof lockbox. A lot of people have these for documents. Um, I myself, I think it's a great idea. They've been proven effective and they work in house fires for your most important documents. The only thing, and why I put a caveat, a little question box, uh, a little question mark there, is single purpose. If you're going to have a lock box to hold a handgun, that should be all that's in there because it's a top open, so you don't want things stacked under that gun or that gun stacked under a bunch of paperwork. Um, and secondly, 
is those are small enough that someone can pick them up and walk away with it. So you would have to reinforce it, and same with the single-sized um, gun boxes, is they usually come with some sort of lag screw or a cable mechanism so that you can make sure that that is secured in some fashion, be it to a stud in the wall or um, around a lolly column or something so that if someone, it should be out of sight, out of mind, if someone does stumble across that and has ill intentions to take it away, that they're gonna be faced with a whole other set of problems in order to be able to just simply pick that thing up and run, all right? It needs to be secured. Next part is mechanical device. A mechanical device, rendering it inoperable. Rendering it inoperable, meaning when properly put in place, that weapon will not and cannot function. Will not and cannot function. So, an example, there's two major examples. The classic trigger lock, which you can see here. Yes, thank you. The trigger guard. The trigger guard makes it so that our number one safety is our finger right here, right? Our finger cannot manipulate the trigger and therefore sending this tool, a gun is a weapon, a gun is a tool, right? And it only works if you manipulate it as such, right? That this right here cannot make its way into the trigger guard and pull the trigger and then, you know, the firearm goes off. The one thing about trigger guards is you cannot tell, at just looking at that weapon, whether it is loaded or unloaded, with the exception of a revolver. Um, but you can tell whether that pistol in the center of that picture, or that rifle, is loaded or unloaded. You would not know. So, the other alternative, there's plenty more, but two of the, the major ones that we show, is the cable lock. And this picture is great because it shows a rifle, a pistol, and a shotgun through, they have one continuous cable, but you could break those down as simple cables for each on how to properly stow your weapon using a cable lock. And people sometimes, and I have found them sadly, is a weapon with a cable lock simply through the trigger guard. Can you point on the trigger guard? Yeah. yeah. So they wrap it through here instead of through the top. Um, you can still pull that trigger with a trigger guard through there. And the point of the trigger guard here is uh, you're unable to load around in there. All right, uh, magazine rather. Um, putting it through here, not going to do anything. Even without a magazine, not without, without getting into major detail about weapons and how they function, you wouldn't even be able to drop a bullet in and try to shoot a single bullet out of that weapon without a magazine. All right? It renders the weapon entirely inoperable. So with this, there's a ton of options out there. There's a ton of different safes that have far advanced technology that kind of combine both of these items. Um, however, in plain, as simple terms as we can get, let's talk about best practices using both. Anybody who owns a long arm, a shotgun, a rifle, lawfully to transport that weapon, it has to be in a locked container with ammunition separated. So why not save yourself a step and have that weapon in your safe already with some sort of mechanical mechanism on it, rendering it inoperable. Then you can put it in a case. If you're driving to the range, you can put it in your car. Your ammo would be separate from your weapon. So in such as an ammo can, which is lockable, just you can put a padlock on that exact ammo can right there. Therefore, you've just taken that a step. They're secured that way. You know when you go into that safe that that weapon is entirely secure. More off, anybody, anybody, for whatever reason, for the nine million reasons we can think of, would be able to go into that safe and know that that weapon is entirely rendered inoperable and is unloaded, all right? True, people, people try. That's why if it's properly lag down and heavy enough, they won't, they won't be able to do that. But, good point though, say they just take the safe. Safes are time barriers. Anybody who is uh, committed enough to do it and has the opportunity and the willpower and the means to do so 
we'll probably get into that safe after a whole lot of time, effort, and, and heartache, right? So they pop open that safe. Are you just going to hand deliver them a nice weapon that they can go out and use if they're breaking into a safe illegally? Maybe they'll use that weapon illegally the same means. So if now they have a cable lock on that thing or a trigger guard, now they have to go through a whole extra step to get to that weapon. Can you right. carry a gun broken down, long rifles? Long rifles when transporting to go to the range? Yeah. Um, so. I thought you could. I thought it was important. Yeah, so you, you can, it. yes. We'll get to that question, save that question. <clears throat> That's, there's going to be a whole lot of what ifs. A whole lot of what ifs, okay? Um, but we're talking for home storage right now, okay? Home storage, as you can see, using both. Regardless if it's a single pistol safe, having a trigger guard or a cable lock on that weapon. For people who say, well, what about home defense? I would argue with you that home defense, if you train. I cannot force you as a licensing officer and uh, an actor of the state and the town of Reading. I cannot tell you, you have to train. You have to train. If you want a gun, you're going to have to train. I can't do that. All I can say is, a 16-year-old that's getting his license or, his or her license isn't going to simply take the keys of their car, take their parents' car, go to an empty parking lot, and drive around in it until they say, yeah, I'm doing this right. They would have no idea whether they're, they're driving, sure. Just like anybody can go to a gun range and pull a trigger on a gun, you're shooting, but are you doing it right? How would you know otherwise? Professional guidance. Professional guidance. Someone that that's what they do, that's how they teach. If you're going to do home defense and you want a loaded weapon in a quick access manner, that's fine. You're lawfully able to do so as long as that weapon is stored properly. This is just best practice. This is taking it to the next level. Um, I would argue with you to say take a home defense course, buy a professional, buy an accredited source, and get trained. Because there's a lot more to learn if you're simply trying to protect yourself that you wouldn't think about unless going to that training. Okay. Ammo separate. Corrosion. Ammunition comes in cardboard boxes. Cardboard boxes retain moisture. Therefore, a ammunition having lead in it, uh, other heavy metals, versus a hardened steel, perhaps, of a rifle and a gun, ammunition is going to corrode faster than a weapon. So. For the people who stack their weapons on top of a bunch of ammo boxes, that ammunition box might retain moisture, and then you're going to rust out your ammunition, or corrode your ammunition, and possibly rust out your weapon. So, what I tell people, for that simple purpose, usually that's enough to say, oh, I don't want my weapons ruined, that's great. Move your weapon to a separate locker. Same, same rules apply, as long as it's lockable, not readily accessible, and not out in the open. All right. Um, these are just best practices for your own safety. Think about grandkids, think about um, neighbors, you know, whomever. Put someone in the mind that I want these people to keep them safe. Um, and this is our best practices and recommendations. And lastly, um, valuables, separate. Same thing for that example I gave, reaching into that safe. Thinking you're finding money and you're gonna get a gun. Don't want that to happen. I'd also say, I know you had mentioned someone taking the whole safe. They take your whole safe, maybe they have to get in there to get your firearm. Do you also want them to have your social security card, your jewelry, your passport, whatever else you keep in there? So just as a best practice, it's good to keep that stuff totally separate. Talked about police concerns. If you want to get into statistics, Registered gun owners represent the highest echelon of non-violent, law-abiding citizens. Therefore, it is unlikely, it is actually an anomaly, that as a, a registered, licensed gun owner, um, that we would have a negative law enforcement interaction with you, okay? So, therefore, how do we still have to facilitate conversations for people, and I would assume unintentionally, breaking the law? It is because of these administrative things such as inheritance, failing to register your weapon properly, failing to renew your gun license on time, 
very small things like that. So another important thing, and, and this will, when you come down, if, to, if you have a license to carry or a firearms identification card and you wish to renew that, we're starting to facilitate these conversations more and more in order to make people aware of how to prevent these things. And this is this exact form that we'd like to continue. If some of you don't have a gun license and want to learn about this stuff, this is a great way that we can outreach. So our number one thing that we have dealing that we are dealing with is registering your weapon. In your handout, the eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper I gave you, that particular form on the back, if you would flip it over, is a state form. The Reading Police Department, we hand these out, but this is enhanced, this is handled entirely by the state. All right, and in that form, this is for you to see if you currently are a registered gun owner, meaning that you have a license to carry or a firearms identification card, and you have properly registered your weapons with the state as is required, <clears throat> as you are required to do so. It is your responsibility to do so if you get a weapon to register them. You want to see what comes back to you. You can't just call us the writing PD and say, hey, what guns are registered to me? I can't give you that answer. All right? You have to go to the state. More importantly, and we'll get into this a little bit more, for a variety of reasons, and I mentioned old guns, your grandfather passed it down to your father who passed it down to you. All right? Um, that's just a classic example of something that we just dealt with the other week. And it was a gift. Gun registration didn't really become uh, a problem until the, the 1980s, all right? And then it was paper. And then in the 2000s, when they switched over to digital records, um, uh, taking all those paper records and making them electronic, well, that's a huge process. So there's a lot of poor records keeping because they assumed that through attrition that the buying and selling of weapons would fix the digital problem. Well, that didn't happen because people caught on that guns are actually very valuable. They hold their, they retain their value quite well, and the people just want to retain them. So that inheritance, that improper inheritance, uh, the passing down of a weapon, it just never got re-registered. So this is on you as the gun owner to inherit, uh, to register your weapon. Previously, the FA-10 form um, was a triplicate form that the buyer and the seller filled out together, and it had the buyer's information, the weapon information, and the seller's information, and one, the top form went to the Firearms Records Bureau, the next form went to the seller, and the third form went to the buyer, and then everybody got a copy, and uh, the Firearms Records Bureau would do the administrative work on that. Well, far too often that was filled out improperly, or information was left out, or wasn't sent to the right people, or people were just like, Kinda, they don't know about it, and you and I both know we have the weapon, maybe I'll just borrow it from you, and if I don't like it, if it becomes an issue, it's still your gun, you know, kind of that backdoor thing. With liability now, that's, that's not acceptable by, by today's standards. So, the digital FA-10 form. It is done digitally. It is very simple to do. For, the, for individuals who are not computer savvy, this is something as uh, the licensing officers, this is something that we like to assist. Because not for big brother purposes, I would want you as the citizen, it is your property. I want that weapon to be known as your property for your sake, because not everybody can have guns. And therefore, far too often, we deal with the problems of individuals having to figure out where this gun is going, and perhaps it was intended for somebody, and if we can't find an owner, then it's likely going to get crushed in a hydraulic press and turned into scrap metal. And far too often we come across these beautiful pieces of, of history. Um, guns are, are very intriguing to me for the historical purposes of them. And they just get smashed into to scrap metal because the person didn't properly register them, they passed, and they didn't say where they were supposed to go to um, or, or what for a variety of different reasons. So it would behoove you as the gun owner to register your weapons for your sake. They're your property. And I don't want after the fact to be scratching our heads to say, well, 
Was it that person's father's property? Next to kin, is he still alive? Maybe he's still alive, maybe there's a family feud going on and people are pointing fingers. We don't wanna to have to step in the middle of that and just say it's probably just gonna get destroyed. So please register your weapons. If you flip that form back over, I provided you with the web address. The web address. Again, if you're really struggling with this and you need assistance, we will gladly facilitate it at the Reading Police Department. We do it all the time, okay? But for you, if you want to do it from the comfort of your home, we give you the ability to do so. Secondly, maybe there's a few of you in here who have purchased weapons. Um, there's a, you can do private transfers from person to person, and maybe you get, you know, so-and-so is trying to sell this gun. Sometimes there's not a great place to meet up in here, or it feels somewhat awkward to meet up privately to try to facilitate a weapons trade. Um, lawfully, obviously. And you're showing this person your LTC, and they're showing you theirs. It's kind of awkward. Then you fill out the forms, kind of go your separate ways. This has taken out a lot of that awkwardness to be able to do it from the comforts of your home, to facilitate the trade ahead of time, see the weapon then, inspect the weapon, maybe in front of a, a, a gun store owner, um, and then you've done the paperwork um, ahead of time to facilitate that trade um, fully, safely, what have you. Um, and then at the bottom of the page, the information that you're gonna need, LTC number, pin code and we'll get into inheritance and the exceptions to that. Um, and it's just a step-by-step -step process of filling out the owner information, the weapon information, the seller information, and then clicking con uh, confirmation. There's a digital record of it. We can see it from the state's perspective in order to make sure that if you had an issue and this guy or gal is giving you a hard time, we can step in um, and that you have the confirmation that you can um, have for your records keeping. It is your responsibility as the seller um, and the buyer to fill this out. It is your responsibility as the seller and the buyer to fill this out. This is why we're here talking about it, <laughs> failing to do so. Ignorance of the law is not an excuse for breaking the law. You need to be able to do it. Failing to do so could result in uh, suspension of your license if you are a gun owner. We really hate to facilitate that for people who otherwise would never be in trouble for any reason. And I found that far too often, all right? So people need to register their weapons, um, and we'll get into more reasons as to why I can do it. Um, pin codes. People lose pin codes all the time. Luckily, at the Red Police Department, we keep track of that stuff, and through the Firearms Records Bureau, which at the end of this presentation, I'll give you the number for. Um, if you lose your PIN code, anytime you're buying, selling, trading a weapon, you need your PIN code. Um, we keep that at the Reading PD, a simple phone call to us, email, what have you. Um, we can get you that PIN code in, in a moment's time. Same thing, if you want to call the Firearms Records Bureau, um, for whatever reason, instead of us, please feel free to do that. They can give you the, the, the code as well. Here's the form that we talked about. It does cost $20. Um, that's the, the state's price, we have nothing to do with that, um, but it, this will give you a variety of information. Um, if you pop open your safe and you see three guns sitting there and you know, yep, I own three guns, and then you fill this out and the state kicks you back a nice little form with a ton of information about two guns that you own, and you're going, I know that I lawfully own three guns, and actually that is usually the case. You lawfully own that third gun, you perhaps just, for whatever reason, it never got registered properly, or it's an older gun, you've had it for quite some time before the, the digital era, and um, or digital gun registrations, and all you have to do is go back to that gun portal page um, and register that, or give us a call, and we'll help facilitate that registration for you. But you wanna make sure that the number of guns that come back on this sheet matches up to the actual number of guns that you own, okay? And again, that is your responsibility as a gun owner to do so. What's the information that you need in order to register? I'm gonna go over that in one second, great question. Um, also, so I gave you a little pamphlet. The ATF personal firearms record. 
teamed up with the ATF, and um, this is what they give out to their federal firearms licensees. In order to obtain a federal firearms license, is usually a, a cut above what it is for a state that held to a higher standard. Therefore, they have to have great rec records keeping. When you open that up, it is going to ask you for the make, the model, the caliber, the type of weapon, revolver, pistol, sh shotgun, rifle, what have you, um, and whom you purchase this from, the approximate worth of it, and then when you sell it, whom, whom where, when you sold it. It just so happens that that coincides with the exact information in order of what you're going to fill out when you register a gun. So if you pop open your safe and you fill out that for your personal record, we don't need the police department, never needs a copy of that. That is for you. Do not keep that in your safe. Keep it with your documentation that does not go in your safe. And when you go and you need to get the sheet back from the state, the sheet will have all that information on it. Make sure they match up. If something's incorrect, then you can call and make a fix to it, okay? Um, inheritance. Not this one. So Officer Craven had mentioned about inheritance. Inheritance is the, the biggest level of gray area that we deal with. Um, far too often, um, we have sadly a death in the family. That person who passed was a gun owner, and those weapons need to go somewhere. But where? Where do they go? Does the family even know that they exist and that they're there? So, inheritance and order typically goes to the spouse. What if the spouse doesn't want them? What do they do? Simple, we always ask the spouse. We do not facilitate this, this is a civil issue. However, we step in when we are requested to do so, to educate and help facilitate. A spouse, so it, if a spouse does not want them, we say, we'll try to facilitate the trade for you. You can sell them, they're worth money. I can't tell you how much, I can't give you, I can give you a rough estimate through a little bit of research, but we'll bring in someone who will appraise them and you can sell them immediately, you don't have to do anything else. That's it, end of story, that's the most typical. If the spouse says, no, this was my husband's service weapon and I really want it sentimental to me and I want to keep it, that's great. You have 180 days to apply for a gun license. That's six months time. The reason being is the last thing you're gonna be thinking about if you're grieving is registering or getting ready for a gun license and we don't want to put that burden on anybody, all right? So six months time, you can apply. That doesn't mean you have to have it, you just need to get a letter into us to say, I wish I want, I want to apply. Um, most commonly, family attorneys, people that do will and testaments, have LTCs. I can't tell you how many attorneys may come in for the sole purpose of doing safekeeping. So if they are going to the will and say, oh, it's listed there's guns on here, you don't have an LTC, but you're selling the house immediately, the attorney can hang on to them for you, or you can transfer them to somebody, whatnot, and that person, if they want to then sell them, they can, or if they want to obtain a license to carry in order to keep those guns, they can. Next would be next of kin. Um, with this, we get this question all the time. My father passed away, however, I don't have a gun license, but my spouse does. Can I still have that gun? The answer is yes. That is perfectly fine. All right, and all that would take is a notarized letter, or uh, the power of attorney, or um, the a copy of the will and testament to say that you are the lawful inheritor, inheritor, and the lawful person to inherit that weapon. Pardon me, and um, that you are going to transfer it to your husband, to your spouse, who has a active lawful license to carry. Um, and the same applies for guns coming out of state. You just have to make sure that they're compliant with Massachusetts and you can inherit them. Um, if they're not compliant with Massachusetts, usually we abide, we request that people and encourage them to sell them, to find a seller. All right, and we'll go through that. That's, uh, I know that's not a fun topic to talk about for a lot of people, all right?
here are the major documents for inheritance to help facilitate and prevent civil struggles and um, a lot of heartache and wasted time. Setting up a firearms trust. It is one of the very few items that you, if you're a registered gun owner, that you can just not give to whomever you want. Say you want to give it to your, your nephew, but your nephew, unbeknownst to you, is a convicted felon and therefore is a federally prohibited person and would never be able to obtain that license. I hope that is not the story for anybody, but just an example that we have to sadly deal with sometimes. Well, your will says that your gun is going to go to your nephew. However, the law would state that's not going to happen. So, setting up a firearms trust in order to dictate that each weapon is going to go to a specific individual or have an action that's going to be sold or it's going to be sent to a museum because it has some significant value to it um, or um, historical purpose for it. All right? Uh, that is on you as the gun owner to set that up. It is something that has really been overlooked in past times um, and people just figured it out but that's why we have so many unregistered old guns in the world today because of that and that's not the best practice um, and we often have to step in on civil issues that we don't wish to be a part of um, because somebody did not plan for this so get out ahead of it set up a firearms trust um, or add it to your will next is power of attorney we're going to talk more about power of attorney as caretakers. Um, if somebody, um, for example, has dementia or Alzheimer's and is, and you have taken over as their power of attorney to deal with their affairs, such as they still have an active license and they still own guns, and you as the power of attorney are stepping in to say that's probably not the best thing for them. Okay. Um, Rightfully so, in inheriting weapons, if we have a copy of the letter of power of attorney, um, therefore we can help facilitate that trade very easily. All right? These are just documents that you, as a person inheriting, if you have a copy of, that way if there's ever any issues, you can prove, one, I was the power of attorney, two, I have a notarized letter from the next of kin saying that they transferred the gun to me because the next of kin, I'm the spouse of the next of kin, something along those lines. Very simple stuff, um, stuff that can be hand drafted or typed up and notarized at a bank. Perfectly acceptable by legal standards. Okay. And lastly, the personal firearms record. This will just help facilitate you. And we have a digital copy on our website if you like to have digital backups of um, of items. Um, it's just really simple to bring to somebody in charge of your will and testament to say, I need this added. Let's get this in there. I've already done the legwork for you. Just make sure it's added in there. Um, and it will just save your family a whole lot of time, God forbid, um, if something needs to happen, OK? In the inheritance portion of the Massachusetts gun portal is the one exception where you're inheriting a weapon from most commonly someone out of state that doesn't have a Massachusetts license. They're not, you're not going to be able to fill out FID LTC number because they don't have one. So last name, date of birth. All right. Um, for inheritance, it implies that the person you're receiving the weapons to, uh, from is deceased. Um, That is not always the case, obviously, um, with inheritance. Um, so you might be receiving a call from the Firearms Records Bureau just to maybe um, fill out a little bit more pertinent information. And when you go into the next slide, um, after you fill out this information and then your own license to carry information and PIN code, um, you have to fill out just a little bit more information regarding the individual. Also in this, you're saying, well, if my spouse passes and I'm inheriting that, per that my spouse's weapons and I have six months to apply for a gun license, I can't do this till I obtain my gun license, right? That is correct. You're not going to be able to do this official paperwork until you've been fully approved for a gun license. Um, and that's something that when you come in to talk about getting a gun license, we, we say, let's schedule a meeting. You know, once you're activated, 
Um, you'll come in, we'll sit down and talk about your gun license, and we can do all this paperwork with you at that time if you'd like. We'll facilitate it all for you. That way, out of sight, out of mind, I'm sure at that point there's other things going on that you mind. The last thing you want to be talking about is registering guns. So we want to take that off your plate for you, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about it specifically. Uh, our responsible ownership kind of sums up everything we just talked about, to be honest. Um, the ability to properly store weapons. Um, you need to have a place, like we were talking about, a safe um, where you can properly store a firearm. The uh, high shelf or the sock drawer, no longer an acceptable practice. Um, the ability to use weapons. Um, that's Something will sort of goes with owner's well-being. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, like I talked about, um, it's an unfortunate problem, but as people get older, sometimes mentally they deteriorate, whether it's Alzheimer's or whatever issue. Um, and knowledge of the laws, again, as Officer Dolly just talked about, um, most gun owners are very much law-abiding citizens. Where they run into issues is the, the, the paperwork, sort of that goes along with owning a firearm and properly um, documenting that you own the firearm. Do you uh, just a couple things to add. If you are a caretaker, if you are a caretaker, these are simple questions. Simple questions to ask. Uh, when is the proper time to start facilitating the conversation? If you're a caretaker for somebody who is a gun owner, think about these questions. Or for yourself. Do I have the ability to properly store this weapon? Is, did I slip a sock over the barrel of the gun and I stick it behind my bedpost? Because I don't have any of the means to do so. Can you go and fix that issue? If you can't, or if you know somebody who can't, it's about time to start having that conversation, okay? The ability to use weapons, I just put that in there because I know plenty of individuals that buy, that own weapons that have no intention of ever using them whatsoever, but, the reason I put that in there is if you have somebody who is actively using weapons and you've noticed a deterioration in their ability for motor skills or cognitive ability and rational thought, that's why we put that in there. You can be a gun owner and never take that gun out of the safe or have it on display or what, whatever the case is, all right? Um, but if somebody is actively using weapons and they're an avid hunter, shooter, that's something you need to look at. Um, Knowledge of the law, a big one. If you are an avid gun owner, I have just found, and I don't have any data to support this, but just by common sense, you're probably more knowledgeable of the law than, than most lawyers I know, including police officers as well. People that are passionate about guns are passionate about the law pertaining to guns, and they know um, the, the finite um, detail of that law. Um, the purpose of this is to say, if somebody's had a gun license for a long time and they haven't kept up on the law. That's what we care about. Gun laws are constantly changing, especially in today's day and age. In Massachusetts, right now, there are 98 bills between the House and the Senate that would vastly impact guns, regardless of where you stand politically, okay? That's a whole lot of changes that could happen, might not, but it's on the person to keep up with those laws. And we do our best to try to get that information out there, but um, somebody that's outdated um, clearly could be doing something that previously was legal that now may not be. So we want to make sure that that uh, does not happen. So as we mentioned a couple times, I'm um, sure at some point almost everyone is somehow affected by dementia and Alzheimer's, whether it's a parent, a grandparent, aunt, uncle. Um, most people have seen how people can deteriorate and how fast. Um, the concern is if there are guns in the home, if that person owns firearms. Um, a common um, symptom of dementia or Alzheimer's is delusion, agitation, and aggression. Um, I know just having worked for responding to emergency calls, um, we, we get them, but they're not that uncommon to have um, someone suffering from dementia who one day they're fine, the next day they think their spouse is an intruder, they have no idea who they are. Um, I know for me personally, uh, my grandmother had Alzheimer's. Some days she would know who my grandfather was, 
some days she thought he was a stranger that was uh, living in her home. Um, the concern is that with the agitation and aggression and the delusions of all that bundled together is would someone with dementia who owns a firearm now decide one day they wake up and they decide their spouse is an intruder, would they use the firearm? Um, also with the early stages of dementia and Alzheimer's, there is an increased suicide risk. I don't, we looked up the numbers, um, I don't. Next slide, um, well, two, slides. two slides. Yeah, two slides. so um, in 2016, the numbers from 2016, there were 8,200 suicides nationally. Um, and for individuals over the age of 65, 61, 6,150 of those suicides incorporated a firearm. That is an astounding statistic, an astounding statistic. I saw a variety of different studies. Some said uh, upwards of 91% of um, individuals over the, over the age of 65 who commit suicide do so by means of a firearm. Um, even so, even with that being unsupported, um, the low end being, I think, uh, two-thirds, about 67%, um, and most of what I saw was about 75%, um, that's still in, in too high of a number, okay? And with dementia, early on, early onset dementia, the beginning stages of dementia is when suicide is its most apparent. Um, that person still has possibly self-awareness and they know that something's not right, they're unhappy with it, um, and those thoughts begin to progress, um, that's when intervention needs to happen, okay? Um, of the 40 to 60% of patients having guns in their household, this is from a recent report from August of 2018 done by AARP, um, a very credible source with a lot of great data. 27%, um, this is, they took data from 1999 through 2016. 27% of people over the age of 65 nationally own guns, own a weapon. 37% additionally live with somebody who owns a gun. So their spouse has a gun, or, or their caretaker has a gun, all right? Guns are readily apparent, and if the suicide rate is on the rise by 28%, which I'll get in the next slide, and it is overwhelmingly a primary use to by means of suicide with a firearm, something needs to something needs to happen. We need to make people aware and create awareness in order to prevent those from happening. Okay. Um, one last stat was, and I don't think it's on here. Um, a national study from 2016 found there were 12 homicides. 12, and that is a small number, but it's 12 too many. 12 homicides were found that a dementia patient mistook their spouse or caregiver as an intruder and shot them dead. 12, 12 in one year. That is far too many, far, far too many. Was that nationally? Nationally, nationally. yes. And that was in 2016? 2016, and I have, the, uh, I have the study on that as well. I can get you that information. Um, this is just a nice graphic um, that we took from Associated Press. I can't take credit for it. Um, and this is, again, you're going to find data all over the map. All over the map. I like looking at credible sources when I cite data. That's why I cite typically um, ranges. Um, I did not collect this data, therefore I cannot take ownership of it. Um, but the most astounding thing that I see through this is 2018 versus 2050. That is very scary, very scary. I think the numbers were 4.7 um, million uh, cases of um, Alzheimer's and dementia expected to rise to 13, is that, is that correct? 14, 14 million by 2050. Um, we need to start planning, preparing, and making people aware of what we can do. Um, to make people comfortable and to avoid accidents and situations like this, okay? Thermostats. Okay, um, it's kind of already covered. Um, 
like you said, um, roughly 200 suicides um, in older adults, I believe it was 65 plus. Was the, 65 plus was the age gap. Um, roughly three quarters were used, used a firearm. Um, I don't know what else you want to say. Well, yeah, just that, just the rest, yeah, 28 percent increase over um, the course of 17 years of suicide in older adults, in 65 plus adults. Um, by the CDC, they get that information um, through cause of death. Um, that's a, a trend that we want to reverse. That's uh, not the means to go. Um, and um, for responding first responders to those types of scenes, to parents and children having to find their loved ones like that, for passerbys, for what have you, um, it's an image that, um, situation that um, we need to start educating people on to prevent. This is for caretakers. So what screening tools do we have? Unfortunately, because this is Dementia is something that we still don't know a whole lot about, and we're still in the, I would say, above infantile stage, but in the beginning stages of trying to combat right now. Um, federal law really only has mentally defective in its verbiage to prevent individuals who shouldn't have guns from buying guns. So how do we say, just because someone has dementia doesn't mean that they can't lawfully own a gun, but it's, a, it's something that should be looked at. Okay? Someone with dementia doesn't mean, oh, that person's mentally defective. No, there's a whole lot more involved to determine whether somebody's mentally defective. Are they a risk to themselves or the public safety? Okay? So, in Massachusetts, we have extreme risk protection orders, ERPOs. This just got signed into law this, this past year. What that is, is um, a uh, emergency order that caretakers, family, and police can take out through the court system. If you live in Reading, you would go to Woburn District Court or come to the Reading Police Department and say, my spouse has diagnosed early onset dementia. They are a registered gun owner. They have been talking about possible suicide and or I have some warning signs. I feel that that person has come to a diminished state and therefore I don't feel safe with them having guns for either themselves, my, you know, myself, or the public safety. We could go to the court and petition for a one-year loss of license. That's, or if you said, nope, I don't want to deal with the Reading Police Department, I just want to deal with it by myself and go in front of a judge, a judge would order an automatic one-year suspension of license. I can tell you, as the licensing team here for the Reading Police Department, in coordination with Chief Sagala, we have a standard to say, if you want to come to us directly and say, and we do this all the time, if you have power of attorney um, over your spouse because of mental, um, uh, men for mental capacity and decline, um, we will say and facilitate with you, sometimes one year isn't enough or we can suspend it and we can reactivate it at any time. If three months of this person, um, suicide is, is an exception, but um, suicidal tendencies is an exception, but if for whatever reason you want to work with us, we don't have to do this extreme risk protection order, but it's an option, it's a tool in your toolbox so you know that you have it. If you come directly to the police department, we have a variety of different options. If you say, I want this, I want my spouse's license revoked entirely, I do not see them for whatever reason through doctor's diagnoses as regaining enough cognitive ability and or they've said so many worrisome things that I need all guns out of the house, we can say, all right, we will revoke this person's license. All right? And this isn't just for suicide. This is for anybody who you know or a loved one who is a gun owner who, at common sense, simply should not have possession of those guns. Because, just because someone has a diagnosis of dementia or, or Alzheimer's, and they have an active license, and they own a gun, as a police officer, 
and I pull over that individual driving to the gun range to go practice their shooting. I will not know about the dementia unless we've had some previous interaction that I might have that information on. I can facilitate a conversation, but medical history isn't something that I usually talk about unless there's some red flags to talk about. So that person, lawfully speaking, will get sent on their way to go about their business. It is upon you as a caretaker to be their better half, to look out for them, and to start facilitating this conversation, because ultimately, it's a similar conversation about when should somebody give up their driver's license. Do you do it after they've had a major, major crash and somebody got injured, or do you do it beforehand to prevent injuries from occurring? Okay? Early intervention is at its best. A national best practice that is just launching off the ground. Um, the Reading Police Department is looking into creating some paperwork for this to help get some education out there for people, is creating a family firearms plan. All right, I'm from a big Irish Catholic family and there's a whole lot of aunts and uncles and nephews and nieces and when grandpa is, is at the stage where we need to start talking about it, there's gonna be a whole lot of opinions, right? So this family plan helps facilitate giving everybody the same amount of information, same amount of knowledge, okay? Um, and dementia patients, signs and symptoms um, before it becomes too severe, okay? Here's our contact information, the number of the phone for the Firearms Records Bureau. Um, you can call the Firearms Records Bureau at any time for your PIN code or just general information, or you can facilitate it through um, Officer Craven or myself. Um, I put up a special email there for me, um, which um, the entire team will get. That way we can put our rates in. Yes, shoot a handout. Um, I will make it a handout for you, sir. Okay, I'll get a, I'll get a photocopy of it for you, okay? Q and A. A lot of questions. Couple questions. Yes, ma'am. I have a question on um, antique um, pistols that are definitely inoperable. Mm -hmm. Are they exempt from registration, or do they have to be registered? Is there a certain age cutoff on the antiques? So, um, an antique firearm would be identified as a firearm manufactured or a replica of that manufacturer before 1899. Mm -hmm. Okay, that actually you do not need to register that weapon. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, is there any plans or does the, uh, the uh, department have an area where someone could service their firearms? Uh, we do not, sir. Um, I would say uh, for liability's sake, that is probably something um, I can facilitate a conversation about it. But um, first, you mean for safely cleaning your weapon? Um, I, we do not. We have it for our own officers, um, but that's not extended to the public. Bringing weapons into a police station is something that we're very, very careful about. Um, for somebody even bringing in weapons for safekeeping, we have a very specific policy and procedures um, for doing so, um, which is simply being unloaded in your car and we'll walk out together verify that they're unloaded, um, and then we'll bring them in. Um, so at this moment in time, we do not have something like that. I think it would be a good idea. We're talking a lot of old guns here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about people to bring down to let us know about them, or just to clean them so because they don't have the means to do so safely at their own homes? Yeah, I think that's, okay. that's mostly it. You know, what do you do with it? Your workbench? Yeah, we, um, we, we coordinate uh, with the Reading Rifle and Revolver Club um, mm -hmm. for a lot of the things that we do in terms of um, mass cleanings of weapons and things like that for our own weaponry. Okay. So I'll definitely bring that up in conversation, sir. Thank you for that effort. What about disposing of old ammunition? We, as the, at the Reading Police Department, um, if you give us a call, um, we can either come to your home to help you facilitate that. We do it all the time. Um, we, uh, that's probably our number one or number two most common call for service in regards to firearms. It's disposing of corroded ammunition um, and safely disposing of it. Yeah, uh, I don't have it with me, but uh, in, in Reading, it's in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. My father had it. Mm -hmm. 
ammunition left over World War II. Yep, sure. I sure. want to get rid of it. Yep, I so because it's over state lines, too. That's, a, that's a confusing one. If you yeah. want to transport it back to Massachusetts and have it here in Reading, we can handle that, or call your local law enforcement up in New Hampshire and they can facilitate it so you don't have to ship it all the way down. I have guns up there too that are left in me. Sure. That I don't have down here. Yep, up there. sure. Common, very common. I'm ready to get my license to carry. In New Hampshire? No, in Mass. Oh, yeah. oh okay. To, uh, was due in April. I haven't got it yet. I'm wondering. We'll talk. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, on the same thing with the ammunition, you don't want us to bring it to the police station. You'd rather come in. Uh, no, no, that's no. Um, if I, I never, I never want to. Yeah, I never want to intrude in someone's privacy in, in their home, um, whatsoever. Um, example: former service member had some training grenades, some training heavy artillery. Mm -hmm. um, at plain sight, I can't tell if that is inert or not. They waltzed in the police department holding them in their hands, <laughs> and that is not a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unbeknownst to us, they didn't call ahead of time, they just kind of strolled in and said, I have this, I want to get rid of it. Yeah, that uh, that would uh, that would cause us some, con some, some concern. So, um, call ahead of time so we can plan. And I always offer, if you would like, because um, we just had a shipment a couple months ago where I removed like 16 boxes worth of ammunition of just collected over decades of time. And um, the person was too, uh, wasn't able to move that on their own. So I said, I'll bring the truck up, we'll, you know, the, our department truck, we'll get it, we'll haul it out for you, we'll dispose of it safely for you. Um, if you want to bring it down all nice and boxed up, we would oh, have a conversation. Just a, yeah, just a thought. Yeah, we would have a conversation ahead of time and just say, hey, leave it in your car, we'll print it out to your car, we'll take a peek at it, and then we'll bring it in. I want to go more into the paperwork. Sure. Now, years ago, I had a permit to carry, mm -hmm. and I never renewed it. But do you still need, or do you still want letters of recommendation from neighbors? Or so we no longer require letters of recommendations that will ask for your references when you renew your reference? license. Yeah. yeah, just a reference. A just written one? Um, I don't need a letter. I just I'm gonna ask you for the name, the address, and the phone number for that individual, um, so we can just call them up and and um, talk to them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, very simple. Um, the renewal process. I know you've been waiting, and I'm sorry for that. That was a common occurrence. Um, that's why we've added to our team. Previously, it was just I. Now we have two two extra bodies, and on top of another officer helping out, Officer Sean Wilson, um, and we never could have anticipated the level of increase, a fourfold increase in our license to carries that we received. Yep. Um, that's why there was such a backup and that's still translating now. But now with our wonderful team, we're getting those turnaround times much faster and limiting them down so you're not gonna be waiting so long. So I apologize um, that you had to wait so long. I assure you, I'll get I'll grab your name before we leave here today. I mean, and, you gave me the letter. It's yep. like, it's okay you used to carry with the old license. That's right, that's right. I don't carry, but yep. I've so had you're it. Oh, so you're lawfully able to still do that. It's right, just, I've had a license for 50 years. Sure. Yeah, but I don't carry the lines. I mean, the lines in Massachusetts. Sure. Okay. Yes, sir. Originally, we got our ID cards. We were fingerprinted. Do we also have a pin code somewhere installed on the car? So um, the pin code is every time you issue a new license, you get a new pin code for the duration of that license and that license. It's not on the card itself. It's not on the card. It's actually ill-advised to write that pin code on your card. Because if someone gets a, a hold of your card with your pin code on it, you just so you get the pin code. We have to go back to you folks. Uh, when you're issued a new license, you get a new pin code at the same exact time. Oh, so they gave you the pin code already when they got the license. Yes, sir. And if you don't have that, give us a call. We'll get it for you. Okay. Yeah, wasn't there a cover letter that came with the license? Yes. Yeah. Yep. You get two letters and your hard copy license when you receive a license to carry. Yes, sir. And then I, uh, I questioned you earlier about uh, being out hunting somewhere, going from point to point. Mm -hmm. My understanding was you could just break down your rifle, you didn't have to put it in the case to, to move it. Yeah, if, if you break down your rifle to the point that it's entirely inoperable, then no one can just pick that up and so use that's it. That's legal. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yep. That's, that's, problem, gun, that's gun parts at that point. The other problem I have is uh, most of the guns I have are kept in cases for their protection rather than in cases that you have here sure. where you put them in a rack. I don't like those cases at all. And that's fine. That's why mechanical device rendering an inoperable or a locked container. A case in itself 
can be a locked container quite easily, right? Yeah. You can take a cable lock, which we have. I wish we, uh, I'm sorry, meant to hand these out. Um, put them up here on the table before everyone's starting to leave, sorry. Everyone's gonna have a cable lock before they leave here, if you wish to take, um, so that you have the opportunity to do that, all right? We wanna set you up for success. So, any case that you have um, that you're able to either put a mechanical device on the weapon itself, rendering it inoperable, or making the case a you locked case. trigger locks and everything, but I keep them in my own cases. Sure, and protection. that that's fine. If you threw a padlock on that case, then you just made it a locked case, right? I don't, I don't have to padlock the case. No, you don't. If you have a trigger lock on it, then you're yeah. perfectly within the letter of the law. Okay. We're just talking about best practice. What is yeah. the best practice? And then I have a, a problem uh, for encouraging them. Uh, my stuff that I'm going to give away would be out of state. Florida, California, and it's New Hampshire. So you're it's are, being and, inherited to those locations. Yeah. So you'd have to facilitate through an FFL, Federal Firearms Licensee. But they won't have them, and that's some of those states don't have them. That you're going to have to work with. That's why you deal with an FFL. So you would go to local FFLs, not saying one's better than the other, but just uh, Four Seasons in Woburn or Collector's Gallery in Stoneham are two ones that are close by. If you went to Four Seasons in Woburn and you said, um, I want to transfer these to such and such in California, that Four Seasons would have to find an FFL in California to say, will you accept this gun? And my and understanding it's on, is you have to do the transfer through a deal like that. You do, exactly. You can't do it yourself. No, um, because right now you can't get into a whole other topic of transporting that weapon right. to that location. So you have to find. So the simple answer would be whether you want to find the legality of being able to inherit that weapon to that state would simply be going through a federal firearms licensee to say, can you find a seller in California Just to take this weapon? I have a nephew in Florida mm -hmm. who was heavy into hunting and stuff. I grew up with me. They own 15,000 acres larger than Bermuda and guns, gun places everywhere. And I want to transfer a bunch of stuff to him. Sure. And some of the stuff already went to somebody's car down there, I think. Well, hopefully that person's properly licensed so they yeah. can legally drive it down now. And that would be my... my, my Except in New Jersey. Yes. In New York City too. Yes, that's a, that's a tough law um, in traveling. I didn't touch on that in, in this forum. Um, we usually have to sit down with the person. There is a federal law that is in the Senate right now for the Federal Reciprocity Act that would be treat your firearms license like a driver's license. And just bringing stuff from one state to another via airline is a problem. Depending on the airline and where you lay over. Yeah, the rule stuff. of thumb is where you begin to where you go, you're lawfully able to possess them both. Yeah, I saw some Virginia and you had to fill out another hundred forms. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but it's very difficult. Even as I went down to the inauguration on the president, presidential protection unit, and we had to fill out forms yeah. to bring our weapons down as sworn police officers and special deputies. I couldn't get right. a connecting flight to look full of the forms. That's exactly <laughs> right. So. It's something that the federal government takes very serious for yeah. the proper reasons. How Any other questions? Deal, yeah, how do you deal with the registration where you have, uh, I have some elderly 22 rifles that are- Not serialized? Long before serials. Mm -hmm. So serialization um, was required after 1967 mm -hmm. and happens all the time. We come across guns. Can we identify the make and model mm -hmm. and the caliber? Yeah. And maybe some proof markings on them? Perhaps, perhaps not. We do the best we can. One of the original owner when I was 14. Yep. It's not gonna, it, it's been a week or two. Yeah, so you know, um, back when, you know, the Model 64s out of the Sears catalogs were never serialized. Yeah. You're not gonna find it. We fill out the most amount of information so that if we come across that weapon, I know it's a, uh, 22 rifle, uh, it's, you know. Bolts. Yep, so exactly. It has sort of some sort of specific marks on it, mm -hmm. and we can go from there. We do the best we can. If it's not required to have serialized, to be serialized, and it's not, right. you're not breaking any laws. It just makes it a little bit more difficult to. Uh, you have records of stuff that was submitted before? Yes, so was, absolutely. Do you have the blue cards? Uh, I can. We get access to them through the Firearms Records Bureau. Yeah. We do well, not actually have them. Okay, because yeah. I know the uh, guys in Stone had a little plot problem of flood and they lost all of theirs. Yes, so that's a common occurrence. That's mm -hmm. why everything is centralized with the Firearms Records Bureau now versus just the police department. And they're above water. <laughs> <laughs>
Absolutely. That form that I gave you, you can actually write in specifically if you're looking for a specific blue card. All right. Any other questions? My last one is the, the stuff I, one time I uh, turned in a pistol and it produced it, and then I listed all of the weapons that I have that one of them was manufactured. You know, is that stuff relevant now or do I have to start doing that again with the new process? Nope, so that's why I would encourage you before to fill out the form to the state to see what is currently registered to you in order to save you the hassle of having to re-register weapons. It probably, I would say likely if you've done it before, it's probably there, but I can only say probably because I, I can't say it with certainty. Okay. Am I right? Yes, sir. Is being armor a helpful step to get promoted? Being armor, you'd have to ask Chief Segal of that. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder if you, you had it for a few years and now you're moving on to something else and he's going to take it. There's, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot with this different factions of that job. I'm passionate about weaponry. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed my time uh, as armor. Takes a lot of time, too. It does, yes. Yeah, there's a lot of training. Um, you know, we have the, the right guy for the job. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of learning. Well, thank you to, uh, to Elder and Human Services. Um, we, we work closely with them. Kristen did not, uh, you know, Kristen works with you guys every day, all day, but um, even since I was a, a lowly patrolman, you know, baby faced on the job, I've been calling Cary Valley for a million different things. Um, these, uh, their services are help, help bring to light the things that we weren't doing as a police department. And we pride ourselves in community outreach. And clearly we weren't, we, you know, a simple call with their follow-up might lead, a, a simple call for, um, you know, a, a medical call that's consistent. And all of a sudden they do some outreach and find out, well, this person was a widower and now they have unregistered weapons or, or unlawfully possessed weapons, which we're not going to charge that person. We want to make sure those weapons are safe and we get that person help and we clear up some civil issues with them as well that um, they wouldn't, they, that would be a headache otherwise. It's through the help of elder services and, and human services um, to help facilitate that stuff. They do a fantastic job and they, they run a, a tight ship down here. Um, last, so. last question. <laughs> yeah. last one. Uh, transferring property rifles to somebody out of state. Yes. We don't have to check their, check their qualifications to receive it. You're going to have to, they, are, they have to be able to lawfully possess that in their own state. Say that again. They're going to have to lawfully, that's why you facilitate it with an FFL. So it goes to the gun store here in Massachusetts. Right. It's sent down to the gun store to whatever state it's going to, and then that person has to pick it up from the gun store and have to prove that they're valid. Okay, so it can, can't be transferred to a person It has to go through No, that. it has to go through that for that exact reason. It's not your job. I mean, you should do your homework. I would strongly advise you to do your homework so you're not selling to a, you know, a felon. <laughs> a lot of relatives. Yeah, yeah that's going to, because you're going to pay transfer fees coming to and, to and fro, and those can add up quite quite extensive. You. You'll pay more transfer fees than the actual worth of the gun, you know? So I don't want to see that happen to you. All right. Well, thank you everybody for your time. Um, I will uh, I will make sure that my our contact information is uh, photocopied and available for all of you. And please feel free to call and email us. Uh,